Hello, I'm Ricky. And I'm Joe, and this is Season 7, Episode 10 of the Beer and Brawl Bad Podcast, slated to come out on June 3rd, 2024. This is going to be our last podcast of the first half of our season. So it's not the last podcast of the season, it's just we're going to take a break for a few months. I'm going to brew some, Ricky's probably going to do something interesting, we might do some AI-generated stuff, and we're probably going to go to a conference or two in between that. I don't think I'm going to Cisco Live this year. I think you are. So we might have yep. some topics there. We're skipping self, unfortunately. Too many of us that normally go can't make it. And then we have some conflicts for that weekend. So <sighs> sadness. We did go to the Science of Beer in Durham, though, which was a very interesting time. Um, just a highlight of it. If you live in the North Carolina area and you're anywhere in the Raleigh, Durham you know, Greensboro, any of that, those sorts of areas where you can get to the, get to Durham within, you know, I think an hour-ish. Science of Beer, totally worth going to. Basically, at the Mule- Museum of Life and Science in Durham, they have this uh, setup where, I said this, this, they have this setup where you go in and they talk to you about the Science of Beer, but they also have like local breweries and stuff come there and you get free samples of beer. So it's like 35 bucks. And you can go around. One of the interesting things that they had that I think you weren't there for was they had a beer and um, cheese pairing. Mm -hmm. So they've done that with wine before. We went to the Science of Wine. That was kind of fun. You spun a wheel. They gave you a beer, and then they told you what cheese kind of went with it. And it was kind of interesting because it does definitely change the flavor of cheese in a very different way than it changes it with wine. Yeah. Because of the, the flavors of the beer. You also have a train that you can ride on that's like a kid's yeah. train that's a lot of fun. I know you got to do that. Um, they have an insectarium and uh, uh, an apiary where you can go in and like be around butterflies. And that's mm-hmm. just so much fun. Uh, yeah, so it was a great time. Had a lot of fun. Brought a whole bunch of friends with us. And uh, I think you had to cut out early, right? So I did, yeah. We're starting to discover that I've got some sort of like wheat or gluten allergy or something like mm-hmm. that. So I've already given up the bread and the pasta, and uh, the beer just didn't sit well with me. Yeah. But we stayed for like, like an hour, hour and a half. And there was a lot of fun there. We uh, we got to the insectarium before you guys did, and it was a lot of fun. Oh, no, you, you no, were there. No, I was there with you. Yeah. I, I went in there. Before everybody else was there, or they were off doing their own thing. Right. And it was fun to play with the insects and, and all that stuff. And we, after you left, we went to the butterfly house for a little bit, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I always yeah. enjoy it every year. If you're in Durham, you definitely need to go for – the cost of it compared to what you get, it's one of the better deals you can get for entertainment. Because yep. there's there are food trucks you can buy food from, but they also have like free snacks, and they're always yep. really good because they're from like local restaurants. Those meatballs so. were so good. The, yeah, I, the like chicken biscuit thing they had wasn't as good, but the meatballs were mm, yeah. so good. Yeah, and and they um one thing that you missed they did like a lemonade thing. No, I didn't miss that. Yeah, did you get the lemonade with the with the cider? Yeah, oh. I. I um, that, that's how you know it was bad because like we had to leave shortly after we did the train ride. Yeah. But that's what I was telling you as we were getting off the train. Oh. You needed to go to the lemonade and the the mix of stuff. I because I had already we'd already planned on doing that like yeah. right after the train ride. So that that's cool. We uh, I also got like uh, they had like a ton of beer that I love there from one of my favorite places, and they had French toast. Yeah, I know you might not remember mm-hmm. that beer, but oh god, <sighs> it was so good. Anyways, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's a good man. I'm looking really forward to uh, the science of wine later this year. That's going to be good because wine doesn't upset you as much. No, as beer not does. at all. Right. So you know, there's no unless they've got some sort of wheat wine, which I'll just avoid. Um, I think I'll be totally fine for that one. Okay, sounds good. Um, so let's get right into our topics. We're drinking my Maple Point Acer Glen. So this is I, I went to Vancouver last year. So this is right at a year old. Like, uh, no, I'm sorry. It's right at seven months old because I made it in um, uh, June, uh, no, October, November time frame last year. Um, and then, like, bottled it, like, somewhere close to December. And it's been setting for, like, six, seven months. Um, but last year in July, mm-hmm. I went to Vancouver and I got um, – like a whole bunch of ingredients while I was there. One of them was coffee. The other was I saw where you could like get this like maple syrup from them. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that would be really fun to make a boche out of that. 
so basically what I did was I, I used local honey because there was no way I was going to bring back 10 pounds of honey. That was almost yeah, like yeah. what, <laughs> what my, um, but I was able to bring back some maple syrup. And so maple syrup that I also bocheted when I bocheted the honey. Okay. So this uh, maple syrup Acer Glen that's been back sweetened with maple syrup, but it's also got a bochet of honey and a bochet of ma- maple syrup in it. Gotcha. And I used orange blossom honey for this. Okay. Yeah. It's really super clear. It's very clear. I mean, it's got a beautiful color. I yeah. Mean, one of the best ambers you can get. I mean, it's almost like apple juice color. It is. You know, it's uh, perfect in there. The flavor is very mild. I'll say that I think the most interesting part about it is the mouthfeel. Yeah. Is it is syrupy, but like in the sense of like true maple syrup. Like it's not sappy, Mm-mm. you know, but there is, it, this is going to sound negative. I don't mean it in a negative way. There's like a sliminess to it. Yeah. There, it's like it kind of coats your tongue. Yeah. yeah. Sliminess may be, may be like the wrong way to describe that in like a mouthfeel t- flavor because that also con- connotates like uh, the kind of feel that you would get from something like, um, uh, what's the stuff I'm thinking of? Um, it's J- Japan loves it. Um, it. The the stuff where oh yeah, yeah. you mean the um, the little fermented beans? Yeah, yeah. No, not like that. Like it's not it's not like mucusy, which yeah. is more of what I call that. It really just is. There is almost like a tactileness to it. Like it's right. still it's a fluid. It's definitely still liquid. But there's some. It's a little bit more like uh, liquid Jello. Yeah, like if you if you didn't like put uh, enough gelatin in the Jello, and it just instead was almost like thick water. You know, it, okay, this is going to be something that almost nobody knows. But if you've ever interacted with like an actual thickening agent for yeah. water, um, you know, because they'll uh, if you're in like a nursing home, I had a um, a grandmother who maybe kind of lost her ability to swallow liquids because she was, couldn't swallow very well. So they would actually put in a thickening agent into her water that just made it thick water. And then so it it's just easier slide to down. swallow. Yeah. yeah. Like it wasn't even to the point of jello. It just really was like viscous water. Um, it's that's, very much like that. And if you look at the legs, it kind of looks like that too. Yeah. Yeah. But o- overall, very good. The, I think my only complaint would really be compared to like the first boche that you made. Mm-hmm. Is that the flavors are much milder. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's kind of what I was going for was more mm-hmm. of a maple syrupy kind of thing instead of a, like a whiskey thing. There are some of the whiskey notes in there, but it's, they're much more demure. Yeah. I think if I was going to make this again, I would probably try to use like something that was kind of peaty in it to bring out some smoky Potentially. notes or put some yeah. smoke in it. Or I would try to amp up the, um, the, I would try to lower the maple syrup and amp up the um, honey boche. Yeah, I think that's probably the call to make. Because I think what really hits you with the honey is that there's a... Compared to most fermentable things, there's a lot of stuff in honey that doesn't ferment out. Mm -hmm. You know, only about 98% of your honey actually ferments. All the amino acids and these other things that exist in it don't ferment out is what provides a lot of those flavors. Whereas I think maple syrup is 100% fermentable. Yeah. So it's great food for the yeast. And I think that is what gives it this very unique mouthfeel. But I think, yeah, I think it, it lacks the flavor characteristics. A lot of that just gets fermented out. There are, well, so the the maple syrup, when I bochet it, probably did. Because I've got another one that's mm-hmm. got some, like, flavors of, of stuff like that in it. And that didn't, like you got more of the maple flavor. But if you let it sit on your tongue, because it's already warm, so it's mm-hmm. not going to warm up anything. But if you let it sit on your tongue for a little bit in the back, you do get some of those maple flavors that come in. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the flavors are there. They're just much milder. They're much softer. Yeah. Um, it's very much like a, um, if you think about a white wine, it's a dry white wine, um, and how like those like are soft palate like flavors. Yeah. That's kind of what this is like. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, it's it is like a soft white wine, not very high acidity. So you know, it doesn't it doesn't really set any receptors off like super hard. But at the same time, it's also very smooth. I mean, this yeah. is, you said it's like what fourteen eleven percent eleven percent. 
doesn't taste eleven percent. I mean, quite in all honesty, it doesn't even taste like four percent. Yeah. Um, there's very little alcohol burn to it. So, like, depending on what you like, like this is a great sipping drink. Like most of the time, you know, peel back the curtain when we do these podcasts. I finish my drink in the beginning and then have to talk the rest of the way through because it's hard to like sip on a whiskey while having a very active conversation. Right. You know, even some of these beers that are like you know ten percent, they're hard to just sip in between you know the middle of sentences and stuff like that. But not this. I mean, it's very very smooth, very sippable. You know, it's got a lot of good properties. I think the flavor just needs to be amped up for next time. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's it's a very mild. If I could pump the flavor up a little bit, like some of those whiskey notes that you get from the Beauchene process mm-hmm. of honey, that would be great. The caramelization. Yep. So try it. Make your own. Make your own a- Acer Glen that's also got Beauchene honey in it. Let's talk about Microsoft Recall. So... For context, this is AI that remembers the last three months Mm -hmm. of everything you do on your computer. It takes snapshots of it, takes images, takes, you know, other snapshot information because that's like a built-in feature of Windows. Mm -hmm. And it uses that for the AI AI to analyze and then bring back if you need to ask questions about something you've done in the past or maybe trying to do something new in the future that it can kind of like predict how you'll do it. Mm Mm-hmm. I've got concerns. <laughs> I I've got massive concerns. We've we've talked a lot about recently how yeah. people are really not in a good relationship with their tech anymore. That the the creators of technology are getting more out of using their product than you are. I'm just trying to understand this use case for the user. I'm going to have the computer record everything I'm doing. For three months on the off chance I have forgotten what I've done in the last three months it resets every three months so it just it it like at as it moved forwards a month it gets rid of the lat the third month of yeah yeah I know it it remembers like my I just want to be clear like the people that are listening that it's not just for three months and then it goes on and does yeah it's, it's always recording everything yeah it's recording everything I've done to a maximum of three months and then if I need to ask it what I did, it can tell me. Yeah. I know what I did. I did it. <laughs> like, I'm not going to claim to have the best memory in the world. I think I have above average memory. I'm not sure I've ever needed this. And if I did, the massively less intrusive way to do this is to take notes. Yeah. Like if I'm if I have a big important meeting, I go write a couple sentences to remind myself. I mean, those AI tools already exist in a lot of these meeting <laughs> tools now. It'll just tell me what happened in that meeting. Go listen to a recording, it'll summarize a recording for me. Why? So what this sounds it, like is a spin on we're going to record everything that you do and then we're going to use this to train our own AI models off of all the things that all of our users are doing with their Windows computers. Yeah, I mean, at worst, it's trying to train your unique skill sets away from you. Yeah. You know, best case scenario, they're just farming you for trying to get you more ad revenue. Yeah, that's, that's exactly but, what I think it is. Mm-hmm. That, that While eventually I think the end game is the farming skill set, I think mm-hmm. right now, based off of what they've said to their shareholders and – what they're doing with it it's trying to guys serving you more ads yeah which i just and we talked a deep link last time about how much i don't like ads (laughs) i'm not gonna bring it up again but it really does make me wonder like what is a user getting out of this how many it, nothing. Every single Absolutely user. Absolutely nothing. They're they're saying that you can recall the stuff that you did in the past. They're saying that it can train the co-pilot AI that's on your computer locally to be able to do more tasks that are like the way you would do it. But no, it's just, it's not, that's not something that anybody needs. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I can see the value in co-pilot. Like, 
I'm trained how to do some particular tasks in a particular suite because, um, you know, you can get different flavors of Copilot. But you're thinking more like GitHub yeah. Copilot or something like that where it's like I'm going to help you complete this for loop or something like that. Yeah, so, like, if you're doing, like, Git, you know, the Git side of things, it's going to write code it's more similar to how you write code or at least guess on how to correctly write the code, sure, whatever. There's some of this, like, they're going to put Copilot into the Office suite where, yep. like, maybe I don't know how to make. Uh, you know, like I was just it was just yesterday, had to make a PowerPoint slide. It had to be like a three-way comparison of something that wasn't one of the default layouts. So I had to go, uh, I got to go make my own layout, <laughs> and because I hate doing that stuff. And yeah, I had to spend a couple minutes making a layout. It'd be cool if you know, PowerPoint Copilot, I could say, hey, I need a three-way comparison slide, and it could put those little text box in there for me. Cool, that's great. I don't need you to watch me do it so that you know how to do it later i already had to learn how to do it i know how to do it now and i made the file if i need to do it again guess what i'm gonna do i'm gonna open that same file and just edit it i don't need you to go tell me how i did it two and a half months ago now i'd almost go the other direction where like look we're gonna we're gonna record stuff for three years. And that's also doesn't get around any of the privacy stuff, but at least I'd see it more. Yeah. What did I do two years ago today? I don't know. Yeah. I know what I did exactly three months ago. I don't know what I did two years ago. At least that's a value to me. Maybe I did do something really cool. Like, yeah. I you know, I think so. Forget the value to the consumer. Mm -hmm. We just talked about last episode, the world's most attacked operating system. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say insecure. No, I was going to bring made, that up. They've made yeah. huge, you know, steps in making things more secure. But the world's most attacked operating system, because it's the world's most installed operating system, and you're going to add something like this to it that's supposed to be encrypted and local and secure and all this other stuff and anonymized and blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. But all it has to do is just have a vulnerability just like, I don't know, the built-in key store encryption, mm -hmm. you know, vulnerability they had like five years ago, the built-in BitLocker encryption, uh, you know, uh, thing that they had like three years ago, the built-in, or, or maybe it was more than that, maybe it was six, I don't know, I'm old. But the yeah. point is... You said this stuff is safe for years, and people keep finding vulnerabilities. This is going to be a vulnerability. Yeah, and I mean, depending on what it captures and how it captures it. Everything. You have to exclude stuff from it. Yeah. It I mean, captures everything you type in, everything you do. It takes snapshots of all of it. Exactly. I mean, how many passwords is it going to capture? Everything. You know, exactly. Everything. There's, you know, <laughs> especially the more vulnerable older generations, have just documents that have their username passwords in it yeah grandma this, is going to pull up her little like one note thing mm -hmm. it's going to have her password in it she's going to copy it she's going to paste it into the thing because she doesn't know how to use a password manager yeah and and you're going to have at least when it was just a file uh, it's a bunch of username and passwords you're going to steal it you're going to go dump it on the dark web and they're going to just hit everything with it what, trying to find out what it is this will at least capture oh it's her wells fargo account i'm sorry I just said grandma. I meant congressmen. Our congress critters yeah. are going to do that on their Windows laptops that are their government handed out laptops. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. That that feature, if it can't be fully disabled, makes me worry about their enterprise setup. Yeah. See, that's not going to fly in government. That's not no. going to fly in finance. That makes it completely un -HIPAA compliant. That makes it mm -hmm. completely un finance they have to like have a way to shut that off yeah there's, there's gonna have to be like a enterprise version that yeah. doesn't have that or they're gonna do the same thing they do with ads where yeah. if it's uh you buy the highest tier you can disable it or something like that which you can only get if you're an enterprise customer no you can get the highest one it's not enterprise no they no, change the that yeah the consumer grade can't get it the highest tier it's, it's a home or professional mm. and professional is not the highest tier. The enterprise tier is the highest tier, and you can only get it if you're an enterprise customer. Really? You used yeah. to be able to buy it anywhere. Okay, but yeah. You can get it you know, for people, like if you, because you can only license that one. It's it's a subscription mm -hmm. model. It's not a. Okay. Yeah. 
So, yeah. It's just going to be problematic. I am not, I like, nothing about this signals good yeah. at all. Look, hey, it signals good for Linux. <laughs> look, 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 we talked about it a year or two ago. Pop I mean, my, OS and things like that are doing good. My Steam Deck is awesome. I've all my com- Linux computers are great. Mm-hmm. Um, and since, like, I can do a lot of things on Linux, I prefer that as my operating system. Right now, my favorite one is still Pop! OS for, like, stuff. But yeah. mm-hmm, Steam! OS. <sighs> Although, speaking of the devil, mm-hmm. I read an article. I didn't include it. And this is a rumor, so I'm not saying that it's confirmed, that Microsoft might be trying to put in a like multi-billion dollar like tens of billions of dollars bid to buy valve really i thought they did put in a bid but it was ridiculously low it was like 1.7 billion that was in the past okay. this is well, i mean that one. was still recent that was like this yeah. was a couple of weeks ago but this is a but new one they're gonna okay so they might up the offer yeah they're not they're i really it. hope that gabe has like like nah man i'm just swimming in money i don't need your crap no, here's because the thing. There there's no leverage. Steam makes it's like a money printing machine mm-hmm. that takes a skeleton staff to maintain. In all honesty, again, not getting into too much of what we do for work, it's a lot like our service. Yes. Yeah. You know, tens of thousands of users maintained by like literally a handful of people, people. Yeah. and that's including the like contract and support staff yep. the actual developers is like a four-person team doing yep. it part-time you know it's like you why would he sell it like sure yeah you can toss a flat chunk of money at him but it's not like there's no risk involved Microsoft, Ubisoft, Activision, all these people try to make their own shops and failed. Yeah. Nobody's done it better than Steam. It takes almost nothing to maintain Steam in the terms of the cost compared but to this, what they make. This goes back to Steam, even though it's a profit making machine, mm-hmm. was made with making user good. Yeah. You know, user good. Man. Me, a good me no experience. Me no speak. <laughs> Joe no speak words. Um, but yeah, they to make a good user experience. They also made things like it. Whether or not you like the like stickers and the you know the badges and stuff like that, mm-hmm. those are things that people are willing to pay a few cents for to be able to get the stuff to make those things happen. Yeah. And Steam gets a little bit of a cut off of it, but for the most part. They're happy getting that small cut instead of trying to make yeah. three months worth of work into a billion dollars. Exactly. And, but they see the end goal of, like, you know, let's say there's Gaben the second, and he takes over, mm-hmm. you know, Valve. Gaben the second is still going to be able to do this far into the future and still be profitable. Yeah. It's the same sort of Nintendo thing, right? Like, for all the things I have complaints about Nintendo, they don't sell to Microsoft because. Yeah, fifteen billion may be a lot of money for the current president, mm-hmm. but they think about like the company as a whole, and they're going to give. Well, they're they're not going to give a good user experience. They're going to give a family oriented experience, but it's the same sort of ideal. Yeah. Whether I like them or I don't, that's what they're going to do. Steam is kind of doing the same thing. They're the good guys ish in <laughs> in this world mm-hmm. of profiteering. And Microsoft hopefully cannot convince them to sell for a one-time monetary profit that then depreciates after that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they'd be crazy to do it. Yeah. Like, because you're 100% right. There's no alternative market. They're they're the leader by a massive amount. I, mean, I guess I mean, there are alternate marketplaces, but there's no well, alternate no, marketplace the, that has the market share to actually compete with them. There's nobody else that's created. I mean, like, I have an Ubisoft account. Mm-hmm. I've got great games that Ubisoft is like, Far Cry, uh, you know, Blood Dragon, mm-hmm. awesome game from, like, years ago. They just aren't producing that same level of stuff for me to go back and buy them off the Ubisoft store and then yeah. their DRM and then their extra stuff that's on exactly. top of that makes it so encumbering that, you know, people that want to play those games can't just get into them and play them. And Steam's just like, here, here's a Steam Deck. We 
made it so that it's really easy to play and it'll play most of your windows games on it and yeah you can play skyrim and all the other games that you like to play all the classic games and you know if you want to play some of the, like the newer games they're coming out and they're steam they're built with steam deck compatibility you know doom and all that other stuff mm -hmm. so yeah yeah i mean there's microsoft isn't gonna buy them for for any amount it doesn't really make sense, yeah. especially as old as Gaben is. Yep. <laughs> it, now, if Gaben was 28, it, then you could maybe do it. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that Gaben at 28, because if you go back and you watch his like, interviews and stuff like that, mm -hmm. he was more idealistic. He's like a John Romero. And well, John yeah. Romero is never going to like be like that guy who's like, let me just you know do this thing. I just mean even in the grander scheme. If, you are, if you're a businessman who's built up your business and you're already at retirement age, in your business and printing money. Excuse me. No, you're not going to sell your business because you're now at an age that you're going to retire pretty soon anyway and live off of whatever the revenue that that business continues yeah. to make. Yeah. Now, if you're 28 and your product's kind of new and like, hey, maybe in 10 years it does all go down the drain, you can be convinced, take a massive pay cut now and you'll be set for the rest of your life. But just like, you're not going to get it from Gabe. Their best shot of acquiring Steam will be whenever Gabe gives it to somebody else. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I hope not. I hope that Gaben lives to be a million years old, and I'm dead before that happens. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see, you know, who, who he passes it down to and what the other structure of that board of Steam yeah. and everything like that. But, you know, yeah, I think it's, it's a pretty pathetic offering. You know, you can't – like, if you look at other acquisitions, right, like people are paying 10 to 100 times the yearly revenue. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't even know what the steam yearly revenue is, but I guarantee you the 1.7 billion they offered is not a hundred times their yeah, revenue. I'm pretty sure. You know, they, uh, so off that topic, cause I was going to talk about that. Like if I was going to follow that article and talk about it. So that, mm -hmm. that'll be another topic for another podcast. Just, we're just kind of getting, give me a teaser. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about, uh, so we just talked about Microsoft recall. We talked a little bit about Microsoft trying to buy Steam. Mm -hmm. Let's switch switch to complaining about Google. <laughs> so Google's search, we talked about last time, has been mm -hmm. deteriorating. It's been deteriorating on purpose. It's not like they just things got worse in the internet yeah. and things weren't good. They could have el eliminated a lot of the things that were SEO and all sorts mm -hmm. of things like that, but they didn't. It promoted more... Um, profit for them now google's got an ai search an mm -hmm. ai summary search and i don't know if you've seen it have you seen it show up it shows up yeah, especially yeah. on the phone oh yeah yeah but it also shows up sometimes on the yeah like, i've seen it on every search i've done recently right i've got a couple of complaints about it that have nothing to do with privacy mm -hmm. um but email scans now, they've always done email yeah. scans for advertising. Like, if you're using their service, they're mm -hmm. scanning your emails. None of that's private. You don't, like, even if you encrypt it, they're going to try to decrypt it and stuff like that, yeah. right? But now they're not doing it for advertisement anymore. They've pledged never to do it for advertisement again. They've gotten enough ads. They know what you like. Now they're going to do it so they can train their AI bot. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we <laughs> talked about this before that, like, I think we were specifically talking about Facebook at the time, but like that's the value in all of these free tech services is they're just selling that information over. Right. And, you know, yeah, they're, they're going to use that to try and pull information, mostly like how to actually talk like a person. And, you know, again, for what? Their, their search has gotten worse. So now they have an AI that anyone with any experience searching for stuff on the Internet has to go fact check anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, look, I'm going to give the AI search this. The like 10, 15 searches I've done since they've implemented this, their AI result has been correct. But I've had to go double check every single time because you can't just trust a random blurb at the top of a screen. Yeah, exactly. But people are going to. That is going to be, it's going to, it's, even if it's incorrect, it's going to become the default answer to things, mm -hmm. you know, because people like we talked about before, are just going to want to look at that blurb and just be like, okay, that's good enough, yeah. and go on about their life. Um, and that's never good. In my oatmeal example from last thing, the blurb re-summarized the article that I read and gave the non, 
you know, measurement yeah. information about how to do steel cut oatmeals. Mm-hmm. That's just what, why, why, yeah. why would you do that? Like, how is that, how is that even relevant? And so, like, even though it was correct, it wasn't correct enough to give me the information that I needed. It yeah. was useless. Mm-hmm. And unless you make it useful, why would I ever trust that? Yep, exactly. Or like, you know, again, we've, we've talked about how you can't really use Google for academic research too much anymore. So, like, almost everything it returns is some sort of forum or social media that it doesn't summarize very well. You know, it's – the AI is not really going to fix that. No, it's not. It's just going to re – it's just going to reiterate everything that has been bad before. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately what it's going to do is it's going to make having to click through the first ten results to find the answer faster. Yeah. That's all it is. It's taking the bad search experience but making it faster so the AI can summarize it, which – to the end user, okay. Maybe at some point I do trust it enough to not have to go check all 10 of those you know, results myself. But if your underlying data is still not good, you're just making getting to the result faster. That's not actually fixing the problem. Right. You know, we've, I think we've talked about several times on the podcast, but we used to do like the tech topics. Yep. Like when you're doing software, the quality of data in is the quality of the data out, right? Yep. Like you can do analytics all day long. You got to have good data sets. If you're not, if you don't have good data sets, you're, what you're going to have is a bad conclusion. Yep. And if it's not scrubbed right and your data is not like accurate, then you're going to have a bad conclusion. 100%. All right. So here's, here's my concern. So we talked about Google hasn't had like a big like breach yet. Mm hmm. We take the email, and we take the search, because eventually it's going to happen, and we start letting them talk together. That means that your emails are out here in the search land, and someone can probably trick the search AI into telling it what, you know, the corporate Gmail account of, you know, whatever company that's out there you know has in it maybe so th- that would have to be a pretty big blunder on google's part because the data you use to train your language model does not have to be the same data that it has access to in its learning model well right? I un- while i understand that that's already happening with chat gpt though yeah well chat gpt though is pre-trained so what ChatGPT was given like all the internet information from like 2022 and before, or something. But not like anymore. That. Like it's able to get all the internet data now. It's still crawling the internet. Yeah, yeah. But, stuff but what I'm saying is, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the the right way to say this. So, essentially, when you're when you're training the speech algorithms, that information you use to teach it how to talk. Mm-hmm can be separated from the information it knows and can speak on. Right, 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 right. So if Google was smart, it's training its speech capabilities on the emails, and none of that data makes it over to the database that contains the information it knows. But that's not what they're doing with the emails. They're using the emails to search for information for advertising information about the person. Yeah, then eventually they're going to get sued into oblivion. They're going to, they're eventually going to release some information from somebody about this. Um, I mean, maybe they won't. Maybe they have some brilliant people that'll. Mm. I mean, Google has smart people. I'm not, but this is my concern with these two things existing parallel to one another, and the desire to like have them mingle because that's kind of what they're saying in these articles. Yeah, I I would be way more inclined to say those articles are wrong. Because in Google's, like, Google has always been able to read your email. But it has been very specific that the proprietary content of the emails is protected. As soon as we have a business and we use Gmail as our email, and I can find somewhere deep in your learning database that you know 
who my customers are, that's against the law. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd really err on the side that they're not doing that. Because even before a breach, right? Yeah. Like, it isn't, oh, it got released. I was allowed to have it, but I wasn't allowed to release it. They're just not allowed to have that data. That violates a lot of European privacy laws and business laws totally and stuff. Totally understand that. If they're making enough of a profit, they will not care. Because they've already done that with some of the other things that they've done with antitrust stuff in, in Europe. Where they've gotten slapped with fines and they're just like, yeah, whatever. Meta does the same thing. Um, I am very concerned about this. To the point where I'm considering completely switching off. of. I'm, I've been a Gmail user for, man almost two decades at this point and like i'm considering jumping ship yeah that might have to be something i research because they're really going that far i mean european union will, will put in fines for small things but if that's part of their their business model well, google's days in europe are probably limited so i i don't think that that's how they're going to spin it though i think that's going to be the ultimate result I don't think that that's how it's going to be spun because I don't think that that's what they're trying to say they're doing. Uh, but if you read the Google I.O. Uh, that talks about the email scans and then you read the Google I.O. that talks about like how they're like doing the search scans, it's not a far leap to think that they're going to start like mixing the two up because they're probably going to want to a, train their language model on how people really speak. So mm-hmm. that goes back to this thing, and that's probably okay. But then they're also probably going to want to pull some data from what's in their emails. And the problem is there's a lot of people that have personal accounts and business accounts. Mm-hmm. And their personal accounts are very easily set right up beside their business accounts. And so through no fault of Google's own, Google's just the innocent victim here, even though – They're not. (laughs) They've created a system where you just skip. All you have to do is just have human stupidity that allows you to pull out something that's corporate and put it into something that's personal because you accidentally email that. And they're going to blame that on the person. And they're going to say, well, no, actually what we found when we did this is that someone emailed something from their personal account, and that's how that got into our system. Mm Mm-hmm. And the personal accounts are not protected the same way that the, the corporate accounts are. Yeah, I mean, I see that. You're 100% right. But that also then gets to my point, though. They are keeping the data separate. Yeah. What we're saying is, due to human error at some point, someone will put something somewhere they shouldn't. That that really isn't Google's fault. I mean, they're... Well, it, it isn't Google's fault, but it is. So because they've created the system that allows for that and they know that they've created the system that allows for that, that is going to be their ultimate responsibility. I mean, moralistically, yes. Legally, yeah. no. That, that's what yeah, I was I'm getting I'm saying at. morally that they're, yeah, that they, it's going to be the responsibility. Morally, they shouldn't be doing this. I yeah. 100% agree with you. But in that context, like in your example, that would still be legal to do. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think that, that is, and we've talked about how AI is not regulated enough. Right. But that is one of the few things I think actually keeping some people safe with AI is the countries that really take privacy law seriously. Um, you know, because EU is kind of an all or nothing thing. You mess right. the EU up enough and they'll, they will just kick your product out. Yeah. Um, I happened, mean, eventually, so. but it's probably not going to happen with Google. They're like a. It's like Microsoft. They're never going to kick Microsoft out. I mean, they almost kicked Facebook out. Yeah, but Facebook isn't quite Google or, or Microsoft. They're, Facebook is, is up there, mm-hmm. right? But they, they didn't kick Facebook out. And Microsoft and Google are like a rank above them. It's like Apple. They're not going to kick Apple out. Apple may have to like kowtow to them every now and then like that. But Apple, like, okay, so Apple has created a right to repair program pretty much based off of what mm-hmm. the EU did. Apple has also in, integrated USB-C into their products mm-hmm. based off of what the EU said they had to do. Yep. They did exactly what the letter of the EU's laws said. Mm-hmm. They made it worse for the consumer to try to use these products in the way that <laughs> the EU intended for them to make it easier for them. Yeah. So, like, it's... 
it's you're asking for a governmental agency that barely understands this stuff to regulate things in a way where they can actually hem a company that is way smarter than they are into doing stuff in their own bailiwick, essentially. Um, and I think Google has a lot of really smart people who are unscrupulous enough just to – because they no longer do no evil is their mm -hmm. model. Now it's alphabet – you know, does whatever it needs to do to be able to advance technology. And that's problematic, I think. Yeah, but I think, you know, I will, I will point to those two examples. Yeah, they, they followed it letter to the law because they had to. And laws can be changed. Yeah. If, if we're going to make the argument that governmental bodies cannot protect your privacy, then there's no point in having privacy at all. I, right? But I, I right. think that that's what... Well, one, governmental bodies can't, but our dollars vote more towards that. Like, if we just quit letting people take our privacy, we would ultimately get better products that don't do that. So, for instance, if everyone deployed a pie hole in their home, ad networks would need to change to where we would allow them into our, into our homes, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but no plan that starts with if everybody did. I know. Will ever it's, work. It, it, like I I, yeah. I agree with you. Like I know it's it, that's an impossible thing. It just was an example. Yeah, but thing. I mean I I understand what you're saying. Consumers absolutely could take this into their own hands, but the lack of education on the consumer is going to prevent that realistically right. from ever happening. Exactly. So the only thing you do have are your representatives that you give the power to make those changes. And right. The problem is right now, in the U.S. and even in Europe, most of our representatives are aging octogenarians who have no idea how this stuff works, yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah, and that, that is true. I mean, there's, I'm not going to say that it wasn't embarrassing that when they put you know, Mark Zuckerberg in front of Congress, they had to ask, how does Facebook make money? Yeah. You know, no understanding of how it all works. But... They are at least there. They yeah. at least were able to do something you and me could never do, which is make Mark Zuckerberg come in and sit down and answer questions. Absolutely. Not arguing against that. Not saying that that's not true. But what I am saying is that even though these things can change, in our lifetime, they're probably not going to. And while I can't predict the future to the extent outside of our lifetime, right now, if we're talking about kicking Microsoft or Apple out of the EU, that's never going to happen. That's n just never going to happen. Maybe Facebook. Facebook and TikTok, yeah, they're on the plate. They are in a different class. Even though sometimes we put them on the same class and we think that they are, they are not Microsoft or Apple. Apple and Microsoft are in there. Google, in there. Facebook, whatever. No, no. That's not, that's not the same. That's not even – that's like – if you're like, all right, we're going to put Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield in the match, and you're like, all right, that's Facebook and Google, right? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, that's uh, Microsoft and Google, right, or Microsoft mm -hmm. and Apple. If you're like, we're going to put, uh, you know, Mike Tyson and, you know, Ricardo Montabine <laughs> in a thing, that's like two different classes of people that, that are going to be fighting. Ricardo Montabine is not even somebody that anybody knows who, the, who that guy is, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when it comes down to it, they're – Mike Tyson's going to wipe the floor with him. He's got, like, just a completely different set, a completely different class of athleticism when it comes to that. Now, are we talking about octogenarian Mike Tyson? No, we're talking about in his prime, Mike Tyson, who can bite a man's ear off and still win a heavyweight championship. You know, like, the, the, they're just two different levels of people, right? So you're – well, Facebook is a little bit more well-known, but it, uh, the – thing i'm trying to say is that facebook might get kicked out of something like that and it's not going to hurt the profits of the eu it's not going to hurt them as like a whole it might yeah, affect some of their socials you know like like, like people will be like eh, you know whatever i don't like like mm -hmm. the the ability not to use facebook or whatever and they'll like cry about it or i don't like that my meta quest you know doesn't work anymore or whatever but when it comes down to it Android phones are everywhere in mm -hmm. the EU. They're not going to get rid of their iPhones either. 
like those are things that people have in their hands that they use every day. They're the computing devices. Governments use Microsoft as their operating yeah. system. Yeah, I think I think we'll just have to agree to disagree on that one. Yeah, because at the end of the day, Microsoft cannot choose to not do business in Europe. Their business can't survive without the money. Hmm. But Europe can decide Microsoft isn't allowed to do business with them or find them to the point that the business isn't profitable anymore. Hmm. And that's how they were able to get Apple to make the changes they made. And you're right. They made them in maybe the worst way they could and still be allowed to do business. But that's ultimately where it falls, right? Like Microsoft's power in the world is derived from the money they make. Right. Whereas Europe's power in the world is from their own intrinsic resource and the power they're given by the people who vote for them. Right. Like the money can be taken away, but like there's nothing Apple can do to point to the prime minister of a country and say, you're fired now. Right. Mm. Like I get what you're saying, that there, there will be this constant battle and the idea that the EU just flips a switch and says Google's banned now. Is very unlikely to happen. But the, hey, Google, I don't like the way you're doing your privacy thing. You are going to change or you're going to receive this fee, which is 50% of the money you make in Europe. They'll do that. They have done that. And that has been enough to make these companies bend before. Yeah, because I'm, ultimately they have to have the money. I, I don't think I'm necessarily arguing against that. I guess I guess what I'm saying is that, and it's like you said, it's a moot point. We'll, we'll agree mm -hmm. to disagree. Is that, there are two different class, like Facebook and Microsoft are two different oh, yeah. classes. Yeah, of I mean Microsoft. Companies. I mean Bill Gates is worth more than probably. I don't know the market cap. So I'd guess Bill Gates as an individual is worth probably pretty close to what Facebook is. Yeah, or exactly. at least you know the thing. So you're right. Like yeah, they're, those are not the same level of company. And and but, when you're talking about considering like how they influence the things that happen in a continent they're also very different in how they influence those things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I'm just saying, you know, countries have bent companies like Microsoft over their knee before and will continue to do that. I mean, the U.S. did. Like, yeah. it, they, they, they antitrust. Like, it, mm. it can happen. It's just, it's a very different way that it happens. Like, Facebook can just be shut down and turned off and people are like, whatever, right? Like, in, in Europe where it's a little bit more hard to disentangle themselves from like a Microsoft or a Google or something like that because of the, the stuff that happened. And, yeah. and, well, and I, I know that that's like, eh, you're talking about like maybe an inch worth of Well, like I'll, disentanglement. I'll say this. I think you're thinking of Facebook in the sense of if they shut off a Facebook account, they have to just go tell their, um, you know, like, I got to go give a speech and tell everybody in England you're not allowed to have Facebook anymore. Yeah, because that's and what Facebook is. But if we're talking about, like, Meta, that's a little bit different. Meta well, is the company. No, even this is Facebook. I think that's actually probably a harder conversation to have than you think. Hmm. Because almost every country that Facebook is offered in, the government has backdoors into Facebook. Facebook is incredibly valuable to local governments. It's how they track criminals. It's how they, like, stop other things from happening. Yes, you are correct. That That is true. Yeah. Um, but they also do that with, like, Microsoft and Google services, too. Yes, but that that's a little bit different. Yes, so. that's exactly what I'm saying. It's a little bit different. Yeah, well, it's, it's less valuable to them. Like, like an example, and I know I'm probably taking this over again, but if – because you, you were in law enforcement. Yeah. If – Local law enforcement wants to get into a computer. It's mm -hmm. a Microsoft computer. You you got to go a little bit higher. You generally have to get like the FBI involved. But the FBI can pull anything. That's not that's yeah. not that's not accurate. Okay, it it was when I did some work with the the FBI a long time right. ago. Right. It but it is not accurate. You can actually go and get into, um, especially when you're talking about mobile phone information. You can actually, as local law enforcement, get a judge's order to pull all of the information about location data and stuff like that, and you're not going to get that from Facebook. 
Uh, even though it gets some of that information, it's not as accurate as like what your actual cell phone is. Okay, we we were talking about something different. I mean, there there are login backdoors to Windows that like. Uh, no, no, a, a, absolutely. We're talking about stuff that's on the same level. You can get a judge's order to get that information to get that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with Facebook, a lot of times Facebook is its nature as a tool. Like before you even like, if you want to get information off of somebody is. Facebook. Wait, I need oh. to make a correction on what I said. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about like you have to use the FBI to do it. It is a service the FBI provides to lo local law enforcement. Yes. So yeah. a judge gives them, says, okay, I think this is a criminal enough offense. You go to the FBI, you get that, you take the judge's order there, and then the FBI will give it yeah, to you. Yeah, exactly. I'm, but I'm they, saying... they already have that mechanism that exists. Yes. Yeah, I know. yeah, yeah. So yeah, but like a lot of times what Facebook is used for is – Apart from, you can go talk to Facebook with the judge's order and get any information you want. In a lot of countries, you don't even need the judge's order if you're part Very of the true. government. Yep. A lot of time, parts of the government have these like fake bots mm -hmm. that they operate off of Facebook. Like Facebook is part of their monitoring strategies. So like in that sense, Facebook is in a lot of ways closer to like a Microsoft where it's like, yeah, those are the OS you're running. Those are the phones you're using. A lot of times, Facebook itself is a very valuable tool. It's a very valuable intelligence gathering thing. It mm -hmm. is not as valuable as being able to actually intercede in things, like in the like moment. So there's two two different like concepts there. Um, so like for law enforcement, being able to like intercede in the moment is oftentimes way more valuable than being able to like predict what's going to happen. Um, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it is true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if you know something is currently ongoing, if you've got, like, access to their phone and their location data. But, I mean, a lot of the riots happening over the war in Israel is a very great example. A lot of countries in the EU really stomped out the ability to protest on those things. And they did that via Facebook. I mean, they they came out and published it and discussed it. I mean, I I, I I understand that. I don't think that they told all of the story there because, like, looking at those articles, like when they were saying, like, yeah, we did this via Facebook, I don't think that they were telling all the ways that they used to do that because some of that is going to be things that, you know what, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to go on a diatribe for 30 more minutes and we mm -hmm. absolutely have to stop or we're not going to do our D&D &D session today. Um, but, well, I, and I don't want to finish it with me just being like, let me correct you on this, Ricky. I Let's talk about it in the next podcast sure. a little bit more. Like I'll, I'll create a topic about this particular thing. What I will say is you're not wrong. It's just not exactly the way that you're portraying it. Um, and it's not that way because there are some things that we don't get told when it comes to that for security reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's basically it. You know, um, but also the value and some people will say yes and some people will say no. But in my experience, the value of certain of these things is way more than the value of other of these things, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to argue that like Microsoft is not more valuable than Facebook. I was just saying I think Facebook is much more valuable than it was originally given credit for in the discussion. Maybe that that may, maybe I, I downplayed it a little bit too much, but Microsoft is definitely more valuable than Facebook, or Google is more valuable. I, I think if we if there was a tier, it'd be Apple and Google and Microsoft, and then it used to be Microsoft was on mm -hmm. the same plane, but Microsoft is below them now because you don't get as much. We don't have a cell phone that has an OS yeah. that Microsoft's on, so on and so forth. Anyways. We got to end this one this time. <laughs> we, we definitely went for like three hours this time almost. <laughs> it's like two and a half hours. Um, so this has been Season 7, Episode 10 of the Beer and Broadband Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you when we come back from break, and y'all have a great time off. Catch you next time.